Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this week's episode of the Legal Beagle Podcast. We have talked at length about COVID and the changes that it has had on all of us across society. One of the major changes that we saw was in education, and that that applies to people that have little ones, to, to people going to uh, graduate school. And I am fortunate to be sitting with the co-interim dean of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Mr. Zachary Kramer. Welcome, Zach. Hi, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Well, it's good to, good to have you. And I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about, and we'll kind of jump all over the place a bit. Sure. But you have taught at some of the uh, best law schools in the country, including UCLA, Penn State, and of course, the best, Arizona State. Well played. Tell, tell me... <laughs> Tell me, you started your journey at uh, University of Illinois. Mm-hmm. Tell me how you ended up where you are today. Sure. I, I uh, appreciate the, the chance to talk about that. So um, uh, I grew up in Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago, um, in a stereotypically Jewish family where I was told I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer, um, and I can barely count. And so I wasn't going to be a doctor. I also think that you know bodies and blood is gross. And so... I was going to go to law school, um, and uh, I come from a long line of non-practicing lawyers, um, and so there's a lot of lawyers in my extended family, but um, none of them practice law, and so I don't really know um, that I thought I was going to be a lawyer, um, but I was just under the impression that I would go to law school uh, uh, early on. Um, uh, when I was in college, I decided that I, I thought I wanted to be a professor. Um, uh, but I didn't want to be a law professor. I was interested in sociology, cult- cultural anthropology, um, and wanted to do that. But um, because I was interested in law to some extent, I decided that I would I would go to law school and then after that um, get a graduate degree. Um, but a huge chunk of my professional career has been kind of bumping along and people pushing me to things, kind of like seeing my future for me before I saw it for myself. Um, and I wrote a paper while I was in law school um, for, for a seminar. And, uh, um, and the professor uh, asked me to become his research assistant and then also work on a project with him. And then he encouraged me to enter the paper into a competition, which it won, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, and then uh, uh, he, I was writing my law review note and, um, and then he urged me to submit it to a competition and it won the competition. Um, and so suddenly I had these, these two publications um, and he said, you should be a law professor. And I was like, I don't think that that's going to happen. The University of Illinois didn't produce a lot of law professors. It still doesn't, frankly. Um, and, uh, and so he basically applied uh, for a job for me uh, that UCLA was uh, starting a think tank called the Williams Institute um, and uh, focusing on gender, sexuality, uh, gender identity in, in the law. Um, and they were looking to hire a... Uh, kind of a baby law professor, uh, what we in the biz call uh, a visiting assistant professor or a fellow. Uh, and he suggested that I apply and told them about me. Um, and I got the job, which was absurd. And so I, I went from uh, being a third year law student um, and I accepted that job in like February or March. And then come August, I was teaching at UCLA um, and I was ill prepared. <laughs> um, I had no business doing it. And I don't, that's a path that a lot of people took to being law professors a long time ago. They go from school to um, to being a law professor. It's a terrible path and no one should do it. And I hope I was the last. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so I was there for two years um, and I taught some, uh, some courses there. And then I applied for a tenure track job and I, I ended up in Arkansas, um, in Little Rock at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock. I taught there for two years. Um, it was wonderful. Um, the, the, the people of, of Arkansas are, are wonderful. They will fry anything. It's delicious. Um, I loved living there. And, uh, and I taught law and sexuality at University of Arkansas. Little Rock was, I think, the first time they'd offered that course. For a lot of my students, it was the first time they'd really thought about some of these issues. Um, one of my students went on to open a pro bono um, gender identity in the law practice. So I think in a lot of ways, um, it's a huge part of my professional legacy that I had a student go on to do something like that. And I moved to Penn State, um, and I was there for two years. Um, and then I was recruited to come to ASU as a faculty member in 2010 um, by my now uh, a former boss, um, Doug Sylvester, um, who was at the time the associate dean. Um, ASU tricked me into moving to Arizona. 
um, they invited me to give a lecture. Um, and I was the only one in the room who didn't know it was a job interview. Um, and so I was very relaxed because I had a job in a house and I didn't need to stress about it. And then after the lecture was over, they offered me a job, um, which I turned down. And then uh, there was this record breaking snowstorm in Pennsylvania. Um, it'd been snowing for three days and I was basically shoveling my driveway every every couple hours. Um, and Doug called me and said, hey, I heard about the snow. Do you want to move to Arizona? And I said, yes. Uh, and so that was in 2010. And I've been here since. How, what's the connection between you and Doug? How did you guys know each other? So um, uh, I knew uh, I knew Doug through the circuit, just being a law professor. You go to conferences, um, you meet people. Um, and uh, I, I was friendly with um, two folks who were on the faculty at the time when you were a student, um, Andy and Carissa Hessek, who I had known for a long time, for many years. Um, and I think I met Doug, Doug through them. And so I really, you know, it was all three of them, I think, who did the work of, of bringing me here. And now I'm sure everybody regrets cool. it. So. Yeah, they could yeah, go yeah. back. Well, they would do for anything. Those, for those of you that don't know, Doug Sylvester was the former dean of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Uh, Zach and Adam Chattero have stepped in as co-interim deans uh, as he has stepped down, and we're going to miss Doug Sylvester mm -hmm. a lot. I really liked him. Thought he was really uh, cutting edge and forward thinking, and and yeah. really liked the way he looked at the business of law in academic. Yeah in an academic setting, in academia, I guess you, you could say. Yeah. But back to you for a minute. Sure. So you're ping-ponging around the country. Yes. How was that adjustment? How, how was it, you know, getting from the Midwest to the West Coast, back kind of towards the Midwest, then all, all the way to the East Coast, and then now back to the West a bit? Yeah, you know, it was, I mean, it was really fun, quite frankly, um, just to kind of uh, see different parts of the world, get to know different communities. I'm very malleable. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of needs. Um, and, uh, you know, I was nervous. I think the hardest transition was going from, from Los Angeles to, to, to Little Rock. They're very different. Um, and I remember, um, going from the, the traffic of Los Angeles, you know, I lived 15 minutes away from my work, but it took an hour to get there. Um, uh, and so I was always, you know, stuck in traffic and then I got to Little Rock and everybody complained about the traffic. Um, and I was just like... <laughs> happy as could be in the car celebrating, you know, the, the rush 10 minutes. Um, and so, uh, but I, I have these, this really clear recollection in my mind of walking down the street in Little Rock when I first got there. I'd never really lived in the South. Um, and there's some debate about whether Little Rock counts as the South, but I'll, I'll say it does. Um, and, and I remember a person coming up to me and just asking me how I was. <laughs> I was thinking, that's none of your business. Um, but I, I fell into the routine there really well and I became, you know, uh, I would take a really long time ordering coffee, um, because that's how you do down there. And, uh, and I loved it. And, and, you know, I've lived a weird life in the sense that, you know, since I graduated high school, I've been at school. Um, and it's a, it's an odd way to, to go through life. I still think about time in terms of semesters. Um, you know, my wife who, who's not in, in this uh, world professionally, she, you know, she'll say, when should we do something? And I'll be like, ah, the spring semester makes sense. Um, and so my, my, my view is, is skewed in that sense, but I love college campuses and I love, you know, um, academics and I love being around ideas. And so, uh, the kind of common thread of all of these places, even though they're very different communities and cultures, um, is being around people who take ideas seriously and who, you know, want to teach and want to be around students and, and kind of, surrounded by learning. And so in that sense, they're all pretty similar. So we all hit this wall uh, in the beginning of 2020 called COVID. Yeah. What is your earliest memory of COVID and, and you s saying to yourself, this is, this is real. Something weird is going on. What, what, what's the, the earliest memory you can point back to when you're like, Hey, this is going to change things a bit. I panic bought bread. So, so I'm following, <laughs> I'm following, uh, the news out of China. Um, and I am a paranoid person by design. And I kept saying, this is coming here, this is coming here. Um, and, and I don't know that people really thought that yet. Um, and I, I read an article, it was in the New York Times, about, um, about cases that have been popping up across the, um, about, across the globe, and there was no known transmission. Right. And I, I don't know a lot about epidemiology. I can't even say it. Um, but 
uh, it was clear to me that it was spreading and we couldn't track it. And so I went online um, and and bought, I think like 12 <laughs> loaves of bread. I don't know why. Um, it was the strangest thing. And they arrived and I, I didn't tell my wife they were coming. And then suddenly we had no place to put all of this bread. Um, but it was like very crystal clear to me at that point that there a change was coming. Um, and so that was the earliest moment. But I, I will say um, the, the kind of clearest, freshest moment where it really became obvious to me that there was a, a real change going on is when I got sent home from work. Um, I was an associate dean at the law school from, you know, I think it started in 2015 or, or so. Um, I've been doing it a long time. And when we really shut down in the spring of 2020, um, we we emptied the place and uh, and the university only wanted the most most essential people there. Um, and I wasn't one of them. And <laughs> I was pissed. Um, but <laughs> But like it became, you know, my, my kids were already home from school at that point. Um, but the reality set in that I wasn't going to be going into work every day. And that that just felt very, very strange to me. How was that transition for your students, for, for the, the folks in law school that were studying at the time and then you having to figure out a way to still educate them? It was hard. I mean, it's hard for all of us. We were not prepared. Um, I don't think anyone was really prepared. The only people who were prepared were the good people at Zoom. I mean, talk about a good idea at the right time. Um, you know, we we had um, we had spring break, and uh, and then I think I, if I remember correctly, we extended spring break. Um, but I might be making that up. But my memory is that we had two weeks instead of one, um, where where a group of us had to reconfigure the law school, um, and Adam Chaudhary uh, was deeply involved in that. Um, Doug, uh, my colleague Tom Williams. Um, who oversees all of the kind of technology and among other things. Um, and, you know, we had to answer questions that we'd never really thought about before. Like, does everyone have internet access? Um, uh, do, does everyone have a computer? Um, does everyone have a safe place where they can study? Um, and and we never asked people these questions before. And so suddenly we had to, you know, to do that. And, um, and we had to kind of fill in the gaps. We had to, you know, teach people how to use the technology um, we rely pretty heavily on, on adjunct faculty and, you know, professors coming in from the practice world. Um, and uh, the technology was new to a lot of them. It was actually um, uh, really impressive and inspiring in terms of how all of our adjuncts came on board with all of the policies we were developing. Um, and we had to find our students. Not all of our students were in Phoenix. Uh, we had to make sure that they were connected. Um, a lot of our students, um, once we kind of shut down physically, uh, went home. I remember I talked to a student who was in Iowa a lot. Uh, we had students, you know, across the globe. Um, we're a pretty small college compared to the rest of ASU. I mean, the problem at ASU, you know, it, it is a it is a global university, and so students all over the place, kind of tracking to make sure they're safe. You know, students in China wanting to get out um, at the time, and you know, dealing with various kinds of lockdowns. And so we were we were not prepared because no one was prepared, and we we worked all day long, all night long, just to get to get it ready to get into some sense of remote instruction. And, and I am of the view that remote instruction can work, but it's never going to be as good as in-person instruction. Um, and so it was a really, a really jarring shift for a lot of us. Would it be similar to what we're experiencing here where you would be on camera and your students would all just be on their laptops, yeah. just listening to your lecture and it, taking notes? It was all over Zoom. So, you know, you, depending on how you want to configure it, um, you know, you are seeing, I mean, imagine like a first year towards class, right? You know, say you have 70 students, you got 70 of those little boxes, you got to figure out who everyone is. Um, and, you know, not everybody had a blackboard and not everybody had PowerPoints the kind of the way they were used to. And PowerPoint's actually easy, but the teaching technology, I mean, when I teach property, I run around like a maniac and I'm throwing things at students and handing out stuff. Um, none of it would, would work and it certainly wouldn't translate uh, to Zoom. And so, you know, from a learning environment, it's just, it's, it's different. I mean, you can prepare for it and I think you can make the most of it um, in that sense. Uh, but it, it requires prep because it's, it's a, it's a transition because we, we have online education at the law school. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a platform for that and, you know, it's, it's often asynchronous. And so we can pre-record the lectures. We have a recording studio. And so, you know, we can optimize that setting, but kind of thrusting ourselves into this remote, uh, setting is just not something that we were we were ready for. And that's that's in what 2020 you, when it initially happened, right? And I want to talk about how things have have evolved yeah. from there. But it's evolved what did lot. you like? Yeah. 
what what did you like most about that? It's easy to say the things that you don't like, but what did you like most about having to educate in that in that way in that forum? Uh, you know, I, I think there's a there's a commonality to it um, where we're all kind of thrust into these situations. Like my dog is sitting right here, right? Um, she's not going to make a lot of noise. We have another dog who's upstairs who would not be able to be down here with me. I'm in the basement. Um, I've been shunned. Uh, and so <laughs> like the commonality that we're all in this really unusual state, and you, you know, people with families, you can't, you can't hide the humanity of everyone. Um, you know, when you come to a classroom, it is a, I don't want to say safe space, but it's a sanitized space in a certain way. But when we're thrust into people's lives, um, I, I think there's a leveling quality that's actually really healthy for a lot of a lot of people um, because it's really easy as a teacher. I've been teaching a long time to get frustrated, you know, when a student's not prepared, for example, right? But the reality is, I have no idea what's going on in that student's life, and um, they could have, you know, dependence issues with kids or childcare or a sick family member, or they're just going through something that's occupying their time. Um, when we're in this kind of remote environment, you know, you have to accept that that's, you know, going on and that we all have these lives, especially at a time when we're all nervous and scared and people are getting sick. Um, and so I think that that brought a level of humanity to education that I think is, is sometimes we lose. Um, and I, and my, my sense, you know, we're, we're back to in, in person now. Um, and so obviously the pandemic is still going on, but my, my sense of the experience is that we have brought that humanity with us. Um, and I think that is the benefit. That's not the right word. That is the silver lining um, of, of this terrible experience um, is that there's a, there's a humaneness to it. How do things look now? Take me through or catch me up to what things are like at the law school today. Yeah. So, so, so I'll walk you through the progression. So, so we went remote, fully remote in spring 2020. And so, you know, the students in that semester had about a month and a half, I think, give or take of live instruction and then never came back to the building. And so those third year students, uh, they, they never came back. They, they graduated. Um, we then had the summer and we had a, the summer to prepare. So what we didn't have in 2020, spring 2020, was any time to prep. We knew at that point that we were going to be returning to some sort of instruction that was going to have an online component and um, and a live component because um, that's where the university was going. You know, th these decisions are often not up to the law school um, because we're part of the university and these are university wide decisions. So the university wanted to bring back some live instruction um, and have the opportunity for some remote instruction. Uh, and so, uh, but again, it's always in flux because of, you know, changing infection rates and all of that. So you have to plan as best you can, knowing that you might have to um, change or pivot at the last second. And we, and so we plan to go hybrid. Um, and what hybrid meant for us was that the, um, you'd have a mixture of students in the classroom and remote. Um, and you might also have a mixture of faculty in the classroom or remote. Um, and and so uh, we planned way ahead of time. Um, we had to get faculty who wanted to be in the building teaching from a classroom, um, up learning how to the te technological ways of doing that. Um, we had to repurpose staff because now, you know, with people, students remote and faculty in different locations, um, it required a, a person kind of on the ground in the room to make sure the technology was working. And so it's staff who had other jobs that were not classroom jobs or technology jobs were kind of repurposed to, to focus on that. We called them facilitators. Um, so we had to plan that. We had to create that schedule. We had to come up with, um, you know, we had a fewer number of students in the building for um, the 2021 school year, um, but we had to like think about their safety and, you know, how do we get them in the building? How do we keep them separate? Um, we had a distance, we had a tape off, you know, and so we had a long time to prep that and, and we did. And it was a, a full court press the entire time. We, um, from basically from the moment that the 2020 year ended, we just went into prep mode. Um, and we successfully, you know, went through that 2021 school year um, in that remote setting. Um, ASU announced then for the, the current year that we were gonna be live, um, immersive. Uh, and so again, we had to go into prep mode. Um, and we, you know, we were, we had to undo the physical distancing in the building, um, cause we're still distancing to some extent, but not to the extent that we were, um, you know, we had to, uh, 
address the mask question. We had addressed the, you know, the kind of cleaning question. Um, and uh, for a number of our students, they'd never been in the building before. And so we had to reacclimate those students to what life was at ASU Law when it's a physical space, not just a, a virtual space. Um, and, and we bear a huge responsibility because for a lot of our students, we are the primary kind of focus of their life right now. Um, and so, you know, we got to do it right. We got to do it safe. Um, we have to be uh, supportive. We have to be especially supportive now because, you know, it's, it's so hard for so many of our students. Um, and especially when we have students coming from out of state, they don't have people here. We have to make sure they, they find people, they find community, and they feel like uh, they're being supportive in a safe environment. And so that's the challenge. Um, I think it's going great. Um, our students, um, they're, they seem very happy. They're being responsible. Um, I will tell you that I have found that guilt is the greatest um, way to get people to take masks seriously and, um, and think of their kind of fellow members of the community. Um, but it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And, you know, a lot of our students are still um, understandably very scared. Um, and it's our job to, uh, to make sure that we can provide a space that they feel like they can learn in, that they're safe. Um, and that they can flourish and grow into uh, to lawyers. Putting on your uh, your co interim dean hat, yes. d do you see law school applications increase when something like this happens? When the economy kind of takes a turn? Yeah, usually, um, usually when uh, you see that turn, um, uh, graduate degree applications go up. Um, you know, in the middle of COVID. Um, at least measure it as it is right now. Um, uh, applications were down across the, the country. Ours were up. Um, ours have been up every year um, uh, for, for many years now. And so we didn't see that, um, that kind of uh, downturn that a lot of schools did. Um, and then uh, this year, this past year, uh, they were up nationally. Everybody's application numbers were up. I think people were waiting um, for places to kind of return a little bit. Um, and so there's some sense right now, the conventional wisdom is that they're going to be down again this year, but our applications are up. So we're getting more applications um, uh, right now than we were at this time last year. And so uh, my sense is that ASU law is special and that we are defying a lot of the, the norms because we have built such a, uh, a remarkable institution. Um, Phoenix is an unbelievably vibrant city. Um, we are the only law school in town now. We are deeply entrenched in the legal community. I always tell students that, you know, one of the things that's going to set your legal career, your legal education career, apart from almost any other um, law student is you're going to be in an elevator and you're going to be in the elevator with with federal judges, with state Supreme Court judges, with lawyers, um, because they want to be a part of legal education, and we're uh, and we're the we're the number one game, not just in the state, but we're the place, the only place in town. You're not going to get that in any other city, especially a city this size. And so it's it's remarkable, and I think the the city of Phoenix, the state of Arizona, has embraced our students. Um, our students are phenomenal. They're 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 smart. They're creative. Um, they have you know high emotional intelligence, which I think is crucial. Uh, and so it's a really it's a special place, and uh, we built that culture and students, they, you know, they gravitate toward it. They want to, they, they want to spend their education among a supportive place. That's going to help them thrive. How do you, it's, it's a, it's a difficult responsibility to manage in the sense that you are the only game in town yep. in the Phoenix Metro area. You have all these applicants that want to come to school there. You can't say yes to everyone. That, that, that makes sense. And, and that's no different than any other law school or graduate study program in, in the country. But how do you how do you guys look at admissions as a whole as it relates to the impact it has in the community because of the fact you have to deny students more than you accept, yeah. to be honest? Yeah, I mean, our class is big now. I mean, we have our current 1L class is 312 students. So we're, we're much bigger um, than we once were. But even at that kind of that size, we still end up rejecting unbelievable candidates. Um, and it's really hard. Um, and so, you know, we've tried to do a couple things. One, we have a, um, a program called the MLSH, the Master's of Legal Studies Honors Program, um, where uh, students who don't have the credentials to get into the JD program can enroll in this program and they take JD classes. Um, and if they hit in their first semester a certain GPA uh, uh, marker, they will be admitted into the JD class, right? 
Um, and it's it's an interesting way of thinking about admissions testing because uh, currently the LSAT is still the uh, the the number one way we test the kind of to get into law school. But there's no better test of how well you will do in law school than how you do in law school. And so those MLS students who don't have, for instance, the LSAT number to get into a school like ASU, but they say, I can do this, right? Trust me, I can do this. And then they come, they take classes with the JD students and they they thrive and then they become a JD student. So we have that approach, um, which I think is is the only one of its kind in the country. And it's it's a way to find, I, I don't want to say diamonds in the rough because I think that's a terrible way of talking about this. It's finding um, the students who, for whatever reason, don't you know have our kind of our numbers, but are still going to be phenomenal students and excellent attorneys. Um, and then we also, we're very serious about transfer students, right? Um, because again, the best, and, and I know that this means a lot to you, right? And the, the best uh, the best way to judge how someone's going to be as a law student is how they are as a law student. And I firmly believe that a good law student at any law school is a good law student. Um, and, and so, you know, we bring in a lot of transfer students and they have unbelievable careers with us and they go on to founding their own law firms and, and all kinds of things. And so uh, schools that kind of, you know, shy away from transfer students are missing an opportunity to enliven their culture, to, you know, make an even more vibrant place. And so we want people who want to be a part of our community and it doesn't really matter where they start. It matters where they want to end. So you talked about a test that, that is kind of a measuring stick on the front end, the LSAT. I want to quickly ask your opinion, because I don't think I've ever got to talk to uh, an academic about this issue. We, few episodes ago, we had a, an attorney on up in Oregon. They're talking in Oregon about getting rid of the bar exam altogether. Yeah. That's another test that, that measures your ability, possibly measures your ability to, to practice yeah. uh, law. Just what are your thoughts, Zach, about the idea of the bar exam going away? Yeah. Not having a bar exam. Yeah. I mean, so, so let me just say that this is me personally. Um, not, I'm not speaking on behalf of the college. The college doesn't have a perspective. Sure. Um, uh, and then the, the one thing you need to know about me is that I'm biased because, uh, in addition to being, um, a, uh, uh, a law professor, I'm also, I'm a lecturer for one of the bar review companies, right? And they okay. pay me. Uh, and so, and so it would be a statement that gets interest if I said, um, uh, getting rid of the bar. I mean, having said all that, my view of this is. Um, I think that we should be thinking about reforming the bar before we talk about eliminating the bar. Um, I do think that uh, there's value in licensing exams. Um, uh, I feel better when I know that my doctor has been licensed. Um, and, and so uh, I am not in a position yet where I think that we should be abandoning the exam itself. Um, I do think we should talk about reforming it. Um, I do think it's hard to justify the form that it's in. I mean, I remember... I took the Illinois bar and I remember <laughs> studying commercial paper and I was like, I don't know what this is. Um, and, and secure transactions and all of these, these things that I knew I was never going to encounter um, uh, in law. Uh, and I think that's really hard to justify. I also think just the sheer amount of information that you have to learn that you're never going to be tested on. Um, it just, it strikes me as kind of just cruel um, and just keeping it because we had to go through it is the worst um, is the worst uh uh, justification, but but I know that the there are national organizations that are thinking about you know very hard about what a reform bar exam looks like, and I, I hope they do this well um, because the problem the the bar exam as it exists today I, I don't think it can be justified much longer, um, and I think COVID has highlighted a lot of how you know how hard it is to administer the bar exam. You know all these students who are taking it online. Um, one of the things that I, I'm really proud that we did at ASU is we had a number of students who could not, they didn't have the space that would work for um, taking the remote bar exam, whether they didn't have reliable internet access, they didn't live alone. Uh, and so we we gave over all kinds of space in the law school for students in that situation when they had to take the online exam. Uh, and it was, it was work, right? We had to like block off everything in the offices they were using. We had to put up a lot of signs to make sure it was quiet. The internet had to work that day, um, uh, but, Again, I think these sorts of instances, they shine a light on some of these problems. And I think the bar exam is going to have to, it's going to have to modernize. 
I like that evolution, not revolution, meaning yeah. there's ways to make it better and more applicable and a useful tool as yeah. opposed to this oppressive maybe exam that, that doesn't really have some relevance in some regard. I remember trying to wrap my head around the rule against perpetuity, which I'm sure is I near love and the dear rule to against you. Perpetuities. Listen, I used I have the greatest <laughs> example to teach the rule against perpetuities because I grew up in Chicago and I'm a Cubs fan. And so the example I would always use is like in order for this interest to vest, the Cubs have to win the World Series. And everyone would be like, oh, that's never going to happen. It violates the rule against perpetuities. Uh, and then it happened and I can't use that example. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, you have, I, I talked to you briefly about this before we started. You have an amazing Twitter game, which I have never seen an academic, certainly not a, a co-dean of a law school. Uh, can you explain your presence on Twitter? Because if you don't, you got to follow uh. Zachary kramer on twitter it is yeah. actually it's really comical i went back and read some of your old your old uh, posts because i think they were great your old tweets i you know i did not i was a um i was a late bloomer to twitter um and uh and i and i really i really liked it because i think funny people are the best i mean like i could spend my day all day long just reading funny things that people write um, and, uh, I like succinct humor. I think if someone can nail something in a sentence or two, it's the best. Um, and I was definitely not a Dean of a law school when I started tweeting. And if you, if you track my, I, am, I barely tweet right now, um, because I feel the weight of the institution on my shoulders. Um, sure. uh, that's actually not true. I, I, it's, it's a, it's a time thing. Cause the problem for me with Twitter is, is, you know, you go on there and you, you got that gold tweet and then you interact with it. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, I had a tweet that, that went kind of viral at like 25,000 inter- you know, comments or likes. It was the stupidest tweet ever. Um, and it was so much work. <laughs> and then I like, you know, and I did that thing where you mute it. And then I felt like such a, like, anyway, but the thing that I love about Twitter is, um, is that kind of that leveling, like it doesn't really, it's it, so long as it's funny, you know, and I don't, I don't engage a very serious level of Twitter. Um, and to me, it's, it's only about silliness. Uh, but I think it's great. <laughs> I love yeah. it. I love it. I appreciate that. Do you, do you, do you find students talking to you about that or bringing it up or yeah. saying, Hey, you know, professor, I love your, All the time. yeah, love your tweets. Totally. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting. Cause I know, I know faculty that use Twitter as part of their, their classes. Um, and I'm not organized enough to do that. And I also, I'm, I'm not serious enough about Twitter to do that. But I think it's really cool, like finding different ways to get students to engage the material. Um, I, I know of folks who've used memes, right? Like, you know, find a meme to kind of uh, show how this concept works. And I think that's amazing um, and, and super cool. You wrote a book called Outsiders. I did. And there's a, there's a tagline in that book that I want to ask what it means. Sure. Why difference is the future of civil rights. Okay, so Tell me, me about the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, the book is green. It looks like an avocado. Um, and uh, I had the title of the book was Outsiders, the Future of Civil Rights. Um, and the publisher um, said to me, uh, we will only publish this if you change the subtitle. And I was like, fine. Um, and then I secretly tried to not change the subtitle. Um, I never talked about it with them again. And then when I f- submitted the final manuscript, I kept the old subtitle and they caught it at the end. Uh, as kind of, uh, I, I got, I got caught. And so, um, and they said I had to have a subtitle that started with why. And I was like, this is very, very confining. I need, I need to stretch my, my wings. And, uh, and so, uh, let me explain what it means. Um, the, the most common way we talk about equality in American kind of legal language and legal culture is in terms of sameness, right? Like fundamentally we are all the same. And I, I have two kids and they've both gone through kind of like very light civil rights training in school. Um, and, you know, they come home and they're just like, we're all the same. You should treat each other, you know, like, you know, like we're all the same. And um, and that's fine, but it's also not right. Um, and it's also, uh, it's too simplistic, right? And of course they're children, uh, but that's how I think most American law tends to talk about uh, equality. Um, and there's this other way of talking about equality as difference. Right, like we have to treat people differently because they are different, and that's what equality demands. The easiest example of that would be disability law, right? Like uh, disability law says that no two no two disabilities are the same, right? Like people have different um, uh, they have different uh, they have different bodies, they have different needs, 
Um, and the whole goal of that body of law is to create equality. We have to mold the law around that person's needs. Um, and so I'm interested in that kind of way of talking about equality. And at the same time, the bulk of my writing had been about identity um, and ways in which the law has trouble figuring out who we are. Uh, and so I started writing about that in the context of sexual orientation and gender. And there's all of these cases where courts say, you know, is this discrimination because of the person's sexual orientation or because of their sex? And, and they don't know and they can't, they can't disaggregate them. And so the court just kind of punts. Um, and it's bad, I think, for courts to be doing that. And it's even worse sometimes when the court actually concludes, we decide that you are X. And so I was interested in trying to find a way of talking about law that will talk about difference, but then also um, be a little bit more open to people shaping their identities as opposed to law shaping their identities. And I said, is there a way to have a civil rights law that would work like that? And it turns out there is. Um, and the model for it is religious discrimination law. Because in religious discrimination law, you get to say what is religious and is not religious. There are no set rules. This counts as religion. This doesn't count as religion. Um, all it has to be is a, a belief or practice that is essential to you know kind of your core uh, sense of the world, right? So that so vegans can be religious. Um, there's actually a huge amount of case law about vegetarians and vegans being a religious decision. Atheism can be uh, religion. Um, pastafarian or whatever that is can be religion. Uh, and so you get to set the terms about what counts as your belief. Um, and and then we have to try to accommodate it if we can. Uh, and so, so the book argues that we can talk about civil rights beyond religion. We can talk about identity in those terms. What is your identity and what do you need to thrive? And so it kind of shifts the conversation to um, a little bit more self uh you know, self ID, like this is who I am, and then this is what I need. And the question is whether or not an employer or a school um, or you know a prison, these kind of uh, these sites of civil rights, uh, can make space for it. it. It's if you take the that premise and and you actually take it outside of the context of the book yeah. that you wrote or even the law in general. Yeah. I remember as a kid, it was it was encouraged to be different. Yeah, and then somehow it's almost now uh, frowned upon. The word difference has a negative connotation yes. that it should not have it be because we want everyone to feel included or the same. And I like that you, you talk about sameness. Difference is not a negative word. We should embrace and celebrate the differences that we all share. Totally. But 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 it, you, if you said different, just in everyday conversation regarding someone's sexuality, whether it's their religious beliefs or any other identifying marker, you have people that, that might all of a sudden back up from that and say, whoa, whoa, Zach, different. I mean, we're, yeah. we're all the same. We have to treat everyone the same. And I, I think we're missing the mark entirely. I, 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 that's really, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's really cool that you explored this concept. And I, I wondered if that's what, why you kind of change the idea or not what you changed. I didn't know now until today that you changed the tagline, but why difference is the future of civil rights. Cause I think if we embrace it, we understand it and we can, we can make things uh, better for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. And I, to me, um, I don't think difference is, like you said, I don't think it's a dirty word. I actually think it's a magical word. Um, and uh, it's something that we all have in common. There is something about all of us that makes us different. Um, and sometimes it's something that's really important to you. And sometimes it's not. Like I had a dear friend who used to work at the law school um, who passed away, but um, she, um, <laughs> she, she, uh, she loved fast food. I mean, she just loved it. Um, but she was often because, you know, it's, it's academia and, um, she was often like hiding that from people because she, you know, she, it made her different. And, and it's like, you know, civil rights law tends to talk about these big identity traits, um, that we have deemed the most important. And sometimes they are in fact the most important. There's, I'm not sure if you hear it. There's a dog upstairs rattling in the room. Um, um, he's really excited about this conversation. Um, uh, but like to her, it was really important and so much so that she was constantly hiding it um, from people. Right. And so to me, if we could reorganize the law around the stuff that really matters to us, um, I actually think it would be better for everyone um, uh, just to kind of force people to have conversations about what actually matters to them and what they need. So, I mean, part of the, the argument of the book is just we need to talk to each other a lot more. And so I was trying to find a way to reconfigure the law that would force people to bump into each other and say, this is who I am and this is what I need. And is this possible? Um, and, and oftentimes it's not possible, right? Oftentimes it's not possible to accommodate these sorts of differences. But I think 
it's not about winning or losing. It's about kind of coexisting in, in the space that we share. That's right. Well, from fast food to fast five, what a transition. Yes, I love Jack. it. This is the <laughs> this part of, of the podcast. Five questions. We're going to go fast. Ready. And then we'll, we'll end the conversation. Do it. Number one. Yes. Bagels or Bialis? Bagels. Bagels. You had an visceral reaction. Yes. To that. Are Bialis, are Bialis like, I've had a Biali, they're good. So, they're so, fine. so I, <laughs> I think I tweeted about this once. No, I, um, I don't understand the Biali um, and I don't get it. I, I don't, I just don't get it. <laughs> Why? It's a, it's a mystery. It's, someone needs well, to solve this. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's if our, that, you we'll have dogs. That together. Right, exactly. Yeah. The mystery of the Bialy. Yes. You have dogs. If you were a dog, what breed of dog would you be? Golden Retriever. And I am not kidding you. My daughter asked me that question this morning as I drove uh, her to school. And I said Golden Retriever. And she said, yeah, that seems right. Um, Why? Why Golden Retriever? Um, I like to please. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, I, I think for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty jolly. Um, and uh, yeah. Golden Retrievers are always stoked. They're just they're just they're happy. They're, they're just they're happy. Ready. Yeah. yeah, they're yeah. ready to go. Uh, favorite quote. I don't know if I have a favorite quote. Let me think for a second. Um, if you don't, I can pivot. I have a second. Pivot. Give me a backup. That. Yeah, I don't think I have one. Fa- favorite non-related book. Non-related. Not book? not non non-law. I left out a word. Okay. Non-law related book. Oh oh, I mean, there's there's two there's there's too many. Um, I mean the the stereotypically um, kind of Jewish guy that I am. Um, uh, I read Portnoy's Complaint, Philip Roth's book, um, when I was uh, a teenager, and it like it just completely you know blew me away. Um, and so I'll say that, and then I'll add one more because I can't just say one. Um, uh, Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking um, is if you haven't read it, it's sad and it's beautiful. Um, and I saw her once, um, and I think I scared her because <laughs> I was like, the Year of Magical Thinking is so good. So yeah. So she probably tells okay. that story very differently. Go on. Uh, question four. Yes. Best gift you ever got for Hanukkah? Oh, um, the best gift I ever got for Hanukkah. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, my wife gave me this keychain that she found was like the highest rated keychain because I always had problem with my carabiners. And it, 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 I finally broke it, but it lasted for years and it was wonderful. A keychain. That's yeah. the best gift. I, I mean, it's practical. I like stuff that works. You know, sure, I, don't, sure. I don't, I don't need, yeah. Fi- final question. Yes. Maroon or gold? Oh, what gold. Color? Okay. Yeah. We, is it more, maroon? is it, it go, goes with more stuff? Well, I mean, can, can we be, I mean, can we be honest? It's not really gold. It's yellow, right? Yeah, it is yellow. It's it yellow. is more yellow. Um, yeah. uh, but I, I just, I like the bright versus the dark. Yeah. Maroon's yeah. a darker color. Yeah. The gold offsets I'm it. A golden yellow retriever. offsets it. And, yeah. <laughs> of I course, like, you got the pin, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. Where, 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 will you answer those five for me now? I would say bagels for sure. Yeah. I, I had a Biala. I just don't like them. I don't think against them. I just like the bagel. Yeah. Um, favorite what you, dog. What do you put on your bagels? What kind of bagels? Just a schmear. Just a just some cream cheese. I mean, yeah. Nothing. No, no. Yeah. Why, why simple. Mess with Keep it? it simple. Yeah. Yeah. You um, it though, if right? I was a dog. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I was a dog, I would probably be a Rottweiler because I think they're misunderstood. Okay. Not because, not that. because they're mean and, and vicious because they're actually really extremely loyal. And yeah. I'm probably a very, I'm just, I am a very loyal person. I love that. Uh, favorite quote, um, the choices we make in life dictate the lives we lead. Oh, I like that. Who, what is that? Do you, do, you, that? do you know who that's from? No. That's from Danny DeVito in a movie. I can't even remember the name of the movie back in the eighties where he's, teaching these kids at like a reform school. Yeah. I don't know. And he says it. that he says the choices we make dictate the lives we lead. I remembered it. Yeah. And I said, I love that quote. Good. Love yeah. It. Uh, best gift I ever got for Hanukkah. I actually did celebrate Hanukkah. My family's Jewish. I had a uh, best gift. I think I got, I think I was always worried that like, if it was night four and I got a really good gift, I'd be upset on night five. And yeah. so I was always like kind of reserved on my, on like my reactions to gifts. And I had this really bad habit. My mom would laugh and she'll watch this and she'll laugh. I would run in my bedroom and open my gifts. So I didn't react in front of the family and I, then come out with kind of it. a fake reaction. I get it. Like, totally. Yeah. Because like, if something wasn't good. I, I'd be like, ah, oh, that's great. Thanks for the shirt. But, um, I'm trying to think of the actual best gift. I'm, I'm like you, if I got a gift card to something or I knew what it was when I was, um, 
when I was older, I, I was in my undergrad at ASU and I lost, I drove a Ford Escort mm -hmm. and I lost a hubcap Ooh. on my Ford Escort. Ooh. And you see those cars that drive around with the three hubcaps and the missing hubcap. Yeah. And I just couldn't, at the time I had no money and I couldn't afford it. It wasn't, it was a luxury item to buy and missing hubcap. Totally. My mom got me a hubcap. I see. I love it. That's thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that yeah, was yeah. practical and very I thoughtful. love things that solve uh, problems. I mean, that's totally yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm with you on the, the gold or yellow uh, versus the maroon. I love them together because yeah. I'm a diehard devil, but uh, the gold is, is it can go with a lot more things and it's, it's more lively. And one of my favorite colors is yellow just because it, I think it has a sense of positivity I to totally, it. And, yeah. yeah. And I, I totally and, agree. When, when yeah. I got to ASU, um, there was this old rule that the prior Dean before Doug had that you, you could have your office painted. It was amazing. And so, I, and I painted my office yellow and it was just really bright and just kind of airy and beautiful. And I think it's great. Zach Kramer, thank you so much for being on the Legal Beagle podcast. You've been a delight. I, I Check out his great. book, Outsiders. Check him out on Twitter. Check him out at the law school. Check me out uh, everywhere. He's eat yeah, you can just check him out everywhere. Uh, thanks, Dean. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.